Well, hello there, everybody. My name is Dee Dee Verg, and I am your host for Let's Talk Hypnosis, brought to you by HypnoThoughts Live 2018. And today we have my very special guest, Roy Hunter. Welcome to the show, Roy. Thank you. It's an honor. So let me tell you a little bit about Roy, because he's quite extraordinary. He's been in the business for a very, very long time and is very renowned. He's both a hypnotherapist and a celebrated author where he teaches hypnotherapy to professionals domestically and abroad. Roy's hypnosis texts come highly praised and are required reading in many hypnosis schools around the world. I know it was required reading for my psychotherapy training. Roy, originally trained by Charles Tebbets in 1983, brought Charles Tebbets' process of parts therapy to hypnosis and NLP practitioners in an unprecedented way with his book, Hypnosis for Inner Conflict Resolution. His text on hypnotic regression therapy that he co-authored with Bruce Eimer has also received outstanding reviews, and his latest book is called The Art of Spiritual Hypnotherapy. It was co-authored by 25 respected hypnotists from around the world. Roy is also the recipient of numerous awards, including three Lifetime Achievement Awards from three different organizations. So at this year's HypnoThoughts, Roy is going to be presenting a one-day pre-conference workshop on the art of spiritual hypnosis and a two-day post-conference workshop on client-centered parts work therapy. So Roy, tell us how you first got into parts work therapy and then eventually into the art of spiritual hypnosis. Thank you. I'd be happy to. Charles Tibbetts was a recognized pioneer of parts therapy, although there are variations. It's based on the concept that we wear different hats. We all have an inner child. Mm -hmm. uh, we have an inner parent if we uh, happen to be parents. Uh, I have an inner adult. I have an inner professional, which uh, is a hypnotherapy cap that I put on when I work with clients. And I got very passionately interested in parts therapy uh, after studying parts therapy under Charles Tebbets in 1983 because I suffered migraine headaches from age 6 all the way up to age 40. Wow. One parts therapy session resulted in relief of the migraine headaches. And the difference for me is like night and day because I was accustomed to getting two or three migraines a month and usually two or three annoying headaches of lesser severity every week. That was a way of life for me for three and a half decades. And then for the last uh, three and a half decades, it's been as much difference as day and night. I can count on one hand the number of migraines mm -hmm. that I've had since 1983. And of course I can still get a, an annoying headache if I abuse my body and don't get enough sleep or don't walk my talk when it comes to managing stress, etc. Right. So my um, story is similar to yours. Uh, when I was in psychotherapy tr uh, training, your book was one of our textbooks. And I volunteered to be the model for the demonstration for parts work therapy. I had an, uh, and when I say out of control, I mean absolutely out of control workaholic part that I learned from my father to be that way. And I just thought, you got to get more done, you got to get more. And 11 o'clock at night would come and I wouldn't shut down. I was dead tired and I'd push myself to one or two o'clock in the morning saying, I can just get more done, I can just get more done. And the teacher somehow negotiated with this part of mine. She brought in the wise, the wise part of me. <laughs> Yes. And I remember, like, it was, it was profound. I, I remember 11 p.m. would come, and I would just go, okay, time to stop. And that was it. <laughs> Done. <laughs> and I remember the, the shock when I opened my eyes after being the demonstration model in class, and all the students had this look on. I know something had happened. I, I didn't think it was a big deal, right, because I was the one experiencing it. But all the students were kind of like, whoa, <laughs> wow, right? So I knew something profound had happened, but I didn't, you know, realize what it was till later on when I had, when I would have continued the workaholic old part of me. So it's just unbelievable. So how did... It's amazing stuff. You no, know, it? it's unbelievable. I've used it. I remember working with a woman who had a, like a nervous tick in her eye for her whole life and in just one session. I mean, working with the part of her and it was gone. 
She she later needed some follow up because she got herself involved in some situations that weren't healthy for her, and I, I guess it came back as a way to remind her. But um, it, it really is amazing. So tell us how you went from uh, parts work parts therapy to the art of spiritual hypnosis. What led you to branch into an, an even higher level? I would be happy to. Uh, First of all, I'll make one comment on the workaholic theme because I've seen that theme numerous times in my 35 years of professional practice of hypnotherapy. And frequently it uh, is a factor with a person uh, who comes to me for weight loss. And oftentimes parts therapy works when other techniques have failed. I've had clients see me who have failed at regression therapy or uh, NLP techniques or other techniques that are proven to be effective but don't work for all the people all the time. And right. oftentimes parts therapy works when all other techniques have failed. And that's one of my reasons for mm-hmm. uh, being so passionate about the benefits of parts therapy. However, that being said, I don't use parts therapy for all the clients all the time, only when it's appropriate. Right. And one of the things I will teach in the workshop is how to determine uh, when and if parts therapy is appropriate. Okay. And now, to get to your second question about the spiritual hypnosis, mm-hmm. I discovered it by accident in the mid-1980s. A woman came to me for weight loss, and her parts would not come to terms of agreement. Mm-hmm. And no matter how uh, long I mediated with those two parts, they refused to negotiate with each other. So I called out uh, a third part and a part would not emerge at first, but I remembered during the intake that she mentioned she was very active in her church. So I said, whatever part of you is most closely connected to your perception of God or Christ or higher power, uh, for your highest and best good, I ask that part to come forward now. And the part came forward and wanted to be called Holy Spirit. Wow. (laughs) Holy Spirit resolved her uh, inner conflict within minutes. So you might say I discovered it by accident. Uh And even though I didn't talk about what happened, and I didn't even mention it in my classroom because uh, the strength of teaching my course in a community college was that I uh, did not put any religious or spiritual slant on it. I kept it secular Mm -hmm. so that it had the credibility. At any rate, nothing stopped her from talking about it. So it wasn't very long afterwards when somebody came to me asking me if Mm -hmm. I could uh, use hypnosis to help call out uh, her higher power. One client led to another, Mm -hmm. leading to another, until I was uh, doing spiritual hypnosis uh, with greater and greater frequency through the years. Then in the mid-90s, Pam Winkler, who's a psychologist, and I believe she's presenting also at HypnoThoughts Live this Mm -hmm. year, I was talking with her and her late husband about uh, the spiritual hypnosis, and she said, Roy, you need to write a book about this. Mm -hmm. And every time I attempted to write a book, I got stopped. Okay. (laughs) The first time I attempted, uh, I got uh, about two or three chapters written. I was so excited to start writing it that I forgot to save my work, and we had a rare lightning strike. Uh, because we don't get lightning very often in the Seattle-Tacoma area, and the power surge wiped out all my work. Oh. (laughs) I was so angry at myself, and I set it aside for several weeks, made a second attempt, and uh, saved frequently, Mm -hmm. and then uh, after I had several chapters written, I opened an email that uh, I thought was from a friend, but his uh, email had been hacked, and I got a computer virus. I forgot to back up my files, so my hard drive crashed. Then several months passed before I made a third attempt. On the third attempt, I made sure I backed up my files. (laughs) And I had uh, several chapters finished over a period of several months. Repeat history happened. I visited an infected website. A virus crashed my computer and they could not salvage the hard drive. I took it to a computer expert, and he said, your computer's shot, Uh, you're going to need to build a new one. Hmm. And then when I got my new computer, after getting everything all set up on that, I put in my backup disks. The disk was damaged. 
So once again, I lost the files. Right. So I just put it on the shelf for several years. Then in uh, 2003, I was at uh, an annual convention, and I brought it out of the closet publicly for the first time in 1999 while teaching parts therapy in Ireland. I was so overwhelmed with the enthusiasm mm -hmm. and the interest, almost mm -hmm. unanimous interest, among a group of over 40 professionals that I decided from then on I would talk about spiritual parts therapy the last uh, half of the last day every time I taught a two-day parts therapy workshop. So this one lady came up to me after I talked for two days and asked me for a spiritual hypnosis session. And I knew that she was on a good page and in a good space spiritually. Mm -hmm. So instead of accepting money, I asked her if she would do a session for me. I wanted some clarification from my higher power regarding uh, spiritual parts therapy. And many times over the years, I've heard uh, responses such as, all will be revealed in due time, or when the student is ready, the teacher will appear. Right. Oftentimes, people get vague answers which are helpful, but not as specific as they would like. Mm -hmm. I was expecting some kind of answer like that, but I wasn't sure what to expect. I got hit over the head with the metaphorical uh, spiritual two-by-four because my higher power part said, quit dragging your feet, write a parts therapy book first. Oh. <laughs> that was in 2003. Now, that was Thursday night, and the analytical part of me brought myself up out of hypnosis. Yeah. And I said, what publisher do I use? And even though I wasn't all the way out of hypnosis, I was still deep enough that my higher power spoke again, the publisher will come to you. Well, that's all she wrote. I opened my eyes, looked at the lady I was working with. I said, publishers don't come to you unless you're rich and famous. And besides, and she demonstrated she was a good listener because I told her I have a very analytical resistor part right. uh, that might bring Thank me you. up out of hypnosis if I questioned one of the answers. Yes. So she activated the instant trance trigger that uh, I recommended that she install in advance of the trance. And right back down into somnambulism, I went. And she said, uh, what does Roy have to do to attract the publisher? He's already done it. Mm -hmm. And she said, well, uh, when will this happen? Soon. And then my analytical part blurted out. What do I have to do to be in the right place at the right time to uh, attract a publisher? And my higher power said, all will be revealed in due time, end of trance. Oh. That was Thursday <laughs> night. <laughs> Friday at noon, I was autographing copies of The Art of yeah. Hypnotherapy, which is my hypnotherapy textbook, the one that's widely used around the world. Mm -hmm. And this lady who purchased one and had me sign her copy, said, by the way, my husband is national marketing director for Crown House Publishing. Would you consider Crown House for your next book? Wow. I think less than 24 hours qualifies as very soon. <laughs> yep, yep. It's so that's amazing. how the parts therapy text got written as a result of my being on the receiving end of a spiritual hypnosis session. So right. to me, it's not only a very personal, mm -hmm. it has affected thousands of people indirectly and hundreds of people directly who've taken my part survey workshops over the years amazing 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 so tell us what can people expect from well you have two you're running two courses this year so the one is uh, a client-centered approach to parts work therapy um, explain to us a little bit about a client-centered approach for those who, who may not understand what a client-centered approach is there are a lot of variations of parts therapy voice dialogue, mm -hmm. uh, sub-personalities, uh, conference room therapy, ego state therapy, which has now evolved into resource therapy, mm -hmm. uh, the Jaegerian method, which uh, Dr. Edwin Jaeger, uh, retired professor of psychiatry at the University of San Diego, originally called subliminal therapy. Instead of mediating, Dr. Jaeger only calls out one part, the highest intelligence, wisdom, Okay. And he calls it Centrum, the center of the person's intelligence and education. So he has Centrum talk to the other parts. Mm -hmm. So there are various ways of doing it. I find that mediating is a very client-centered way and mm -hmm. helps people feel good about themselves. Okay. Um, so 
So that's been my approach ever since I learned it from Charlie back in 1983. Although Charles Tebbets was an arbitrator, I found I, I had better results mediating because mm-hmm. an arbitrator listens to both sides and then makes a decision and debates with the right. various parts. He called it the great debate. The great debate didn't work for me, so mm-hmm. I had several sessions go south, and that's when I changed to mediating instead of arbitrating. Right. But prior to his passing, Charlie asked me to continue his work. Oh. So uh, it was by request of my late mentor that I got involved in uh, continuing to carry the torch of client-centered parts therapy. Mm-hmm. But I call it client-centered because basically it's based on the concept that the client's inner mind can tell you what the cause of the presenting problem mm-hmm. is if you ask the right questions. Okay. Whereas if I, as a hypnotherapist, attempt to determine mm-hmm. the cause, there's a chance I'll be wrong. In fact, Gordon Emerson, who's the right. uh, protege of Watkins and Watkins, who originated Eagle State Therapy, uh-huh. uh, he stated in writing that if either the hypnotherapist or the client has a preconceived opinion about the cause of the presenting problem, there's a 50-50 chance right. that the opinion is incorrect. And I'm not willing to gamble with those high odds of error. Yeah, and, and I've learned that my own belief systems hold me back sometimes. It wasn't until I began interviewing other hypnotists on the miracles they've seen that I just noticed that our, our biggest limitation is ourselves and our belief systems about what hypnosis can and can't do. Um, the biggest miracles I heard were from hypnotists, you included, who just would try any crazy off the wall thing. Like, can you tell us, just share with us that story about how the woman who was blind in one eye from the time she was four years old, how you did some really interesting hypnosis with her? You know the one I'm talking about, right? Oh, yes. She was a hypnotherapy student of mine. Right. And after I mentioned, uh, working with a client at a workshop uh, on the East mm-hmm. Coast <clears throat> who uh, had 97% hearing loss and he uh, closed his eyes after about 15 minutes of hypnosis reading my lips where I just said at some time if your subconscious decides that uh, you can hear without keeping your eyes open you can either close your eyes or allow them to close and still be able to hear every word I say. Wow. So about <laughs> 60 seconds one. after I, I said that, story. he closed his eyes. And when the session was over, um, his wife came in, and she was a certified hypnotherapist who took my workshop. She said, how'd it go, honey? And he said, I heard him. And I was sitting uh, right. about five feet away from him. And she said, you read his lips? He said, no, I closed my eyes, and I heard him. Oh, and she looked my. at me and she said, uh, when I hypnotize him, if I use my voice, I have to be two or three inches from his ear. Were you sitting in that chair? And I said, yes. And both husband and wife burst into tears and it was a three-way hug. So I shared that story with my class. Uh-huh. And then uh, the lady that you asked about, uh, uh-huh. we'll call her Stephanie, that's not her real name, said, have you ever used hypnosis to help someone regain eyesight? I said, no. She said, is it possible? I said, I don't know. Mm -hmm. And she said, well, she said, "Uh, the doctors can find no medical reason for me not to be able to see out of my left eye. And I did not know that she was blind in her left eye Mm -hmm. uh, until that evening, even though she had already been in my course for four and a half months. My course uh, at that time was nine months. Now it's a year long course. At any rate, uh, She said, would you be willing to experiment? And I said, uh, I'll be willing to go where few have gone before. I can't promise results, but I can promise best efforts. Mm. So knowing that she was a real devout Christian, uh, in fact, she got in trouble with her church the first few weeks of taking my course because they were skeptical of hypnosis. And then she Mm -hmm. started having Tuesday night uh, meetings, mistress of the mind. So she was gradually getting more and more people in her church to become comfortable with hypnosis by doing Tuesday night uh, fun and games, mistress of the mind uh, Mm -hmm. workshops. And she dared the husbands to come along with their wives to the mistress of the mind meetings. So it was really uh, 
cute. Mm -hmm. But knowing how involved she was in the church, I took her to her peaceful place. And in her peaceful place, I said, now you can either stay in your peaceful place or imagine a sacred place where Jesus appears. <laughs> and, and I said, uh, you can use your imagination in whatever way uh, is most effective for you. And imagine either uh, Jesus touching your forehead above the eye that um, desires healing or whatever way is most effective for you. And then I said, while staying totally in hypnosis, imagine that you're putting your hand in front of one eye and opening your other eye and seeing fingers. And now imagine doing it where your hand is in front of your right eye and you're opening your left eye because it was the left eye that was blind. Right. And I said, now imagination is a language of the subconscious. So while still remaining in deep hypnosis, go ahead and uh, put your hand left hand over your left eye and open your right eye. How many fingers? She said, two. I said, no. Put your right hand over your right eye and open your left eye. How many fingers? Four. And I said, now, although you're in deep hypnosis, mm -hmm. it's important that you remember that you were able to see during hypnosis and your brain can retain that memory at a conscious level after the hypnosis is over. And uh, then I went ahead, had her thank Jesus for participating in the session, brought her up out of hypnosis. And before I counted up from one to five, I said, uh, when you get to five, most of you will be out of hypnosis, but your right hand will be covering your right eye. And when you open your eyes, you'll see how many fingers I have with your left hand only instead of holding my fingers up when she opened her high I had an eight and a half by eleven piece of paper marked high H-I with an exclamation mark with mm -hmm. a red felt marker in great big letters so she opened her eye on five high oh. <laughs> and within two minutes she had to excuse herself and leave yeah so a week later she came back to the class and apologized to everyone for leaving the class so abruptly, she said, I haven't seen anything but light or dark out that eye in uh, my conscious memory. Mm -hmm. And she said, um, I knew if I didn't go home immediately, I would be crying for an hour. She said, I got home, told my husband what happened, and we cried in each other's arms for an hour. Mm hmm and then the students were asking her, uh, how clearly can you see? And she said she could see just as clearly out the left eye mm -hmm. as she could out the right eye. And she said, that's really amazing. And then she said, thank you for healing my eye. And I looked at her and with a religious background. I couldn't think of anything else to say other than your faith made you whole. Right. And I do believe that it was her faith mm -hmm. and not what I did. I was a catalyst. Right. We don't do the healing as hypnotherapists, right. whether it's an emotional healing or whatever. We facilitate the client's ability mm -hmm. to tap into his or her subconscious and natural resources and or spiritual resources based on their own religious beliefs. Because I don't have a right to interfere in somebody else's religious beliefs. But in a way, that's one of the most profound spiritual sessions I ever facilitated because the result yeah. was immediate. Then I had to spend uh, a couple of weeks of sessions in the classroom helping her overcome the nausea and dizziness from seeing in 3D for the first time in her life. Oh, right, right. <laughs> now she, yeah, yeah, I totally understand. So if for any of you who had any questions about what you can expect <laughs> in Roy's classes, well, why don't you just sign up, ht, htlive.net. Go to Roy Hunter, and uh, if you're so inclined, please do sign up, because now you've heard. <laughs> some of My full-day class on spiritual hypnosis, based on this book, right. will be experiential. I'll go through the protocols, yeah. but I also consider, uh, even if uh, divine wisdom is accessed uh, during a past life regression, that that can mm -hmm. also be spiritual hypnosis. Yeah. Uh, years ago, a personal friend of mine who was blind since infancy mm -hmm. 
had a grudge against God, and he wanted me to use hypnosis to help him uh, understand why he was blind, because it wasn't fair mm -hmm. that most people had five senses and he only had four senses. So uh, when I asked his higher power to guide him back to discover the cause or mm -hmm. the answer to that question, he emerges in medieval Europe as a castle lord. Oh, and he was a devout Baptist, and okay. that uh, church dogma of the Baptist does not allow for uh, past lives. Mm -hmm. So he uh, has a very visual past life regression, talking about green rolling hills, uh, off in the distance with a blue sky and white billowy clouds, and on the castle side of the moat there was a huge apple tree with bright red apples contrasting on the green grass below. And he said, uh, sitting at a table, an inch thick oak table, and the other direction was a huge stone fireplace with dancing flames of fire. And when I move him forward in time to when something very important happens, he says, my people are complaining that the taxes are too high. Mm -hmm. So I said, uh, no. How do you respond? He said, I respond by raising them. And I tell him if they complain again, I'll raise them even higher. And to keep a long story short, I move him all the way through that uh, lifetime to the first moment of total peace after the transition. What was your primary purpose or mission in that life? And he says, I came into that life to learn the difference between being a leader or a ruler, and I failed miserably. Right. I was blind to the needs of my people, so my soul chose to be blind in this life, so I would remember the lesson forever. Wow. So how did he feel that about his end of his grudge against God for being blind. Oh, yeah, I was going to say, how did he, re so he, he, now that he had the understanding, he, he ended his grudge. Yes, and at his request, a couple of mutual friends of ours witnessed the uh, regression, and one of the ladies asked him uh, how he felt. He said, well, it was amazing to remember what it was like to see, because mm -hmm. I've always wondered what red and green looked like. He said, I've always wondered what a blue sky looked like. I've always mm -hmm. wondered what dancing flames of fire looked like. And he said, now I remember. And one of the ladies said, well, don't you dream? He said, yes, I dream and touch sound, taste, and smell, but he said, I never had a point of reference for seeing. I couldn't even imagine what it was like to see. He said, now I remember seeing. So I dare any past life skeptic to convince him that he didn't live that past life. It's absolutely, again, like, <laughs> hypnosis always, it just shocks me about what's possible. So, so thank you for yes. being with us here today, Roy, and we'll see you at HypnoThoughts this year. Yes, and I hope many of the viewers will consider signing up for either the pre-conference one day on spiritual hypnosis mm -hmm. or my full two-day uh, post-conference on parts therapy because it's a wonderful way, using parts therapy is a wonderful way to help people resolve inner conflicts. Wonderful. And it's all about helping people attain their ideal empowerment, which is what I'm about. Exactly. So thank you so much, Roy. You have a great day. You too, and thank you for the interview. Okay, bye-bye.